For the past decade, a key imperative of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation has been to ensure more children read at or above level by the end of third grade. We are particularly proud of the Third Ward Schools Initiative and our partnership with the University of Houston's Advancing Community Engagement and Service Institute. Each year for the past six years, we've built home libraries for 1,800 students enrolled in five Third Ward elementary schools and supported more than 10,000 hours of reading tutoring annually through the UH Cougar Tutor Program. Cougar Tutor is a very special program at the University of Houston. We created it in 2017 as part of our Third Ward initiative, simply because too many school children across Third Ward were reading below grade level, and the elementary schools just did not have the resources to address the great need of their students on their own. The Cougar Tutor program hires, trains, and places UH students in elementary schools to support literacy instruction. The children of Third Ward build a trusting relationship with a caring adult and develop a stronger literacy skills. I'm trying to sign her name, right? I get the opportunity and capacity to learn new techniques and apply them in classrooms and just incorporate fun in my lessons. I like having tutors in the classroom because they can help me with my work. We as teachers love the extra help in the classroom. The kids enjoy it. Sometimes the university students will sit with a small group of three or four students. And because literacy runs across math, science, social studies, we incorporate that into the other lessons. For example, in a math lesson, they may help the student read a story problem and help them solve the problem. Very good. Since they're seeing me weekly, I feel like we were able to build a trusting relationship. We have nine tutors that are currently on campus and they have collectively worked 4,400 hours with our scholars. Cause look, they're up on a wall. I've been at Blackshear Elementary for two years now as an ACES Cougar tutor. And I've been able to see the kids reading and math levels increase dramatically from what they were last year. And to see that progress is really inspiring for me and for them. In 2018, we started out at Blackshear Elementary with an F in their accountability system. In 2019, it became a C. 2022, now we have an A. And with the help of tutors, coupled with the phenomenal educators that we have in the classroom, helped us go from an F rating now to an A. I put my like grades are hard because of tutors, because it can make me go to like second grade, fifth grade, Second grade, fourth grade, ninth grade, yeah. We congratulate Blackshear and the four other elementary schools in Third Ward for building a culture of reading success. And we wish to express our gratitude to UH and our corporate partners, including Hess, for investing in the futures of Third Ward children. We invite you to be a part of our literacy movement. Together, we can ensure that more children like Justin and Zumari have the resources they need to read and achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Neil and Maria Bush. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the George and Barbara Bush living room and to a celebration of reading. Uh, thank you for joining us on this special night as we shine a bright light on literacy. It is hard to believe that 10 years ago on this very stage, Maria and I announced the formation of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. Since that time, the foundation has made a huge impact in our community, documenting Houston's literacy crisis, publishing a blueprint for community action, supporting organizations that lift Houstonians through literacy, and developing wonderful programs like the high impact U of H Cougar Tutor program that we just saw on the video. Because of the foundation's great leadership, staff, corporate and community partners, volunteers and generous donors, so much has been accomplished. 
Our heartfelt gratitude goes to all of those who served as volunteers, donors, and partners. Our decade of difference making would not have been possible without your generosity. Thank you to our Celebration of Reading sponsor, especially our title sponsor, Phillips 66. Because of you, over 1.8 million has already been raised through this event. We so appreciate your generous support, so thank you. Okay, during dinner, you'll have an opportunity to directly support the U of H Cougar Tutor Program through a raffle of a $20,000 gift certificate made possible by our friend, Tony Bradfield and Tenenbaum Jewelers. Whether you buy a ticket for tutors or make a monetary contribution, know that your gift will be wisely invested in literacy programs that are making a difference and paving the way for a brighter future for children and families. Mom understood that you can't realize your fullest God-given potential without being able to read at an age-appropriate level. Her legacy drives us to lift everyone through literacy. She would be extremely proud of and grateful for the extraordinary work uh, that Julie and the team are doing at the foundation, for the impact that the Ladies for Literacy Guild and the young professionals have in our community. And she would be so thrilled to see everyone here tonight supporting our good cause. While mom is only with us here in spirit, our family remains deeply committed to the long-term sustainability of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation, its programs, and the central role in, the, in making this city more vibrant through literacy. So thank you. Thank you again for going on this incredible literacy journey with us. All right, so we have a stellar lineup of authors who have given so freely and generously of their time and talent to be here with us tonight. And to introduce our first author, please welcome our son and aspiring author himself, Pace Andrews. Yeah, Pace. Our first author, Tess Garrison, is an international and New York Times bestseller of, 30, of over 30 books which have been published in 40 countries across the globe. A graduate of Stanford University, Garrison went on to earn her Doctor of Medicine from uh, California, San Francisco, and served as a physician for many years. Garrison is most notable for her crime and medical thrillers, her Rizzoli and Isle series of novels featuring homicide detective Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles inspired a popular drama series, Rizzoli and Isles, on TNT for more than seven seasons. Listen to me, her most recent book in the series is a fast-paced, harrowing thriller of brutal investigations with dire consequences. Now please welcome Tess Gerritsen. <laughs> Thank you so much to the Barbara Bush Foundation for all you do and for this incredible welcome. I'm really happy to be here in Houston. Uh, I have a little of a personal uh, attachment to it because in 1951, my father graduated from the University of Houston with, with a degree in business administration. So I thought I would talk about something that has to do with Texas. Um, and the time Texas saved the plot of one of my novels. It's a story about how books are written, uh, how the sausage is made, and how sometimes it's not very pretty. Um, so everything starts with an idea, and I get my ideas from all over the place, from conversations to um, personal life to lots of reading I do, and I like to read newspapers, People magazine, I've even gotten an idea once from the National Enquirer. Uh, this idea came from the Boston Globe. It was uh, from the suburbs. It was about a young woman who was found dead in her bathtub. The, uh, there were empty pill bottles by her side, and the police decided it must be an accidental overdose. So they zipped her into a body bag, and they sent her to the morgue. And a couple of hours later, she woke up. 
So yeah, you got that reaction. I had that reaction. And the first thing I want to do was as a human being, I want to know how often it happens. So I did a, an online search for mistaken for dead and I found way too many cases of it. Um, there was a man who was hit in Atlanta and sp uh, spent the night in a morgue refrigerator before somebody heard him moving. There was a child declared dead in Colorado when the nurse realized he was breathing. I have a friend who was declared dead in the intensive care unit, and they were wheeling him to the morgue. The orderly bumped up against a doorway, and my friend woke up. So they turned around and brought him right back to the ICU. <laughs> now, the best story I heard, and this is, this is supposed to be true, was in New York City. A man was lying on the autopsy table. The pathologist was about to make the first cut when the man woke up. The pathologist had a heart attack and died. <laughs> um, I know, it's, it's terrible, but it's funny. So anyway, you take that idea, corpse wakes up in morgue, what do you do with it? Well, what you do with it depends on what kind of a book you want to write. If you're a horror novelist, you turn that into a, a zombie story or a, or a vampire story. If you're a spy novelist, maybe it's Jason Bourne who's faked his death, right? And he's about to escape. Well, because I'm a thriller writer and I was writing the Rizzoli and Isles series, I needed to pull my two characters into the situation. So I use that premise, um, starting this way. Maura Isles is working in the morgue late one night. She hears a noise, she opens up a body bag, and the corpse's eyes pop open. Now, that would be a, a really great opening, right? And so she calls 911, and, and this person gets sent to the uh, hospital where, uh, surprisingly, grabs the security guard's gun, kills him, and takes hostages. And among the hostages this person takes is a very pregnant homicide detective named Jane Rizzoli, who's in labor and is about to have her baby under the worst possible circumstances, uh, with, a man, with a, somebody waving a gun in the air. So here's where, here's where the, the sausage getting made gets messy. Um, I don't plot my books out ahead of time. I had written this, mile, this much of the story. I was maybe 100 pages into the book. I had a hostage crisis. I had personal stakes for my, my, my two heroines, and I didn't know what to do next. I got, I got what we call writer's block. For me, it's plot block. And it happens with every single book I've ever written. It's nothing new for me. Um, and because I don't plot things out ahead of time. Um, I often write myself into corners. And this is, I think, something that I've hap happened to me out of probably 30 out of 32 of the books I've written. It always happens. So this is part of the process that I've become familiar with. Uh, every writer has their own process, and um, it is sometimes excruciating. Anyway, um, what do I do? Well, when I get writer's block, I have to walk away. I leave the manuscript, and it is a handwritten manuscript because my first drafts are always with pen and paper. Uh, never been able to do a first draft on, on the computer. So I walk away and I do uh, a lot of things. I, I go gardening, I, I weed my garden, um, I take a hot bath or a hot shower. You know, the, it's amazing what hot water does for creativity. Um, now remember Archimedes was in his bathtub when he said Eureka. So it is a, a, a well-known phenomenon. What you're trying to do is get your brain to relax and maybe not to think too hard about it. So here's where Texas comes in. Luckily, I had to go do, well, unluckily some people would say, but luckily I had to do a book event way out in West Texas. Never been there before. And uh, so I, you know, I thought that the distance between Abilene and Dallas was like that much on the, on the map. <laughs> You people drive long distances, I can't believe it. So get to Dallas, get in the car, and drive and drive and drive, and oh my gosh, that is a long, long drive. And in the middle of it, your brain zones out, and that's, the con that's, that's where you want your brain waves to be, where you're not really paying attention. And somewhere in the middle of there, I realized I had my aha moment. Now they say, scientists say that they can see the aha moment light up on MRIs. It happens in your uh, right anterior superior cingulate gyrus, I think it's what it is. So my superior gyrus lit up on that drive and I realized what my problem was. I was, the reason I was bored with my story was because it was a man who had taken hostages in a hospital. What's new about that? <laughs> you know, who takes hostages? It's always men. And somewhere I thought, what if I change that to a woman? Now it's weird. 
Now it's interesting. Why would a woman do these terrible things? It gives this, this so-called villain a whole new aspect to him and actually makes them become a victim in a, way, in a way. So I rushed home, I got back to my manuscript, and I pretty much wrote from then on all the way to the end. I don't stop to plot um, to, to correct anything from the beginning. I always try and just write from there on because I find that if you stop to edit, if you stop to correct anything or fix anything, you find that your forward momentum is, is stopping. So for me, it's always push ahead, push ahead. And that's what I did. I pushed ahead and the story ended up being Vanish, which was number five in the Rizzoli and Isles series. So it's an example of how the writing process is messy. It can, it can drive you crazy. It's not as if you sit down and churn these books out. I know that's, that's what everybody thinks. We sit down and we churn these things out. But it, it does involve um, a, lot of, a lot of, and I'm sure um, Nelson will tell you too, it uh, ends up being sometimes you sit there and you think, I'm never going to do this again, or I, I'll never be able to do this again. And now, um, now that I leave, I'm going to have to go home. Uh, there is a manuscript sitting on my desk at home, which is unwritten. I mean, that not finished. It's got 100 pages. I'm stuck. And maybe it's time for me to get in the car and take another drive to Abilene. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. To introduce our next author, please welcome the beautiful and gifted Ashley Walker Bush. Isabel Wilkerson, winner of the Pulitzer Prize and the National Humanities Medal, is the author of the critically acclaimed New York Times bestsellers, The Warmth of Other Suns, and Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. The Warmth of Other Suns won the National Book Critics Circle Award, among other honors, and Time Magazine named it one of the 10 best nonfiction books of the decade. The New York Times Magazine named Warmth to its list of the best nonfiction books of all time. Her new book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, is a number one New York Times bestseller, and Oprah Winfrey declared it the most important book she had ever selected for her book club. Wilkerson won the Pulitzer Prize for her deeply humane narrative writing while serving as Chicago bureau chief of the New York Times in 1994, making her the first black woman in the history of American journalism to win a Pulitzer Prize and the first African American to win for individual reporting. In 2016, President Barack Obama awarded Wilkerson the National Humanities Medal for championing the stories of, un of an unsung history. Please join me in welcoming Isabel Wilkerson to the stage. Thank you so much. It's such an honor and a privilege to be with you this evening. What a glorious day it's been. I want to first express my gratitude to the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy and to the Bush family for your mission and your commitment to literacy and thus to the First Amendment. It's the first for a reason. This mission is ever more urgent in the face of growing efforts to ban books in our country, mine included. We authors and publishers and libraries need as much support as we can possibly get. Thank you so much for your dedication and allyship with us. Now, I'm a maximalist who writes very long books and takes forever to finish them. Uh, my very first book, uh, The Warmth of the Suns, took me 15 years off and say if it were a human being, it would be in high school and dating. That is how long it took me to finish that. <laughs> but one of the reasons why I focused uh, my first book on what I did is because I am a product of the history that I've written about. Because of our country's history, it was actually against the law for my ancestors to learn to read and to write. And here I stand before you as a Pulitzer Prize winner who makes my living doing exactly what they were prohibited from doing. My parents were the survivors of Jim Crow who were not permitted inside the public libraries in their Jim Crow towns in Georgia and Virginia. 
They were part of the great migration out of the South and they made sure that when they got to the, what they considered to be the North, they made sure that their daughter learned to read as a toddler and that she got a library book, the library card that they had been denied. Now my father, he was a Tuskegee Airman and these were among the finest uh, pilots that our country ever produced. And yet after the war, they were prohibited from being able to work as pilots. This is a loss, not just to them, but to our country. And that's one of the things that in animates my work is to remind us about, about how all of us suffer when anyone among us suffers. And so he, uh, along with his, uh, his fellow uh, airmen, had to remake themselves. Many of them went back to school and became dentists or whatever they chose to do. And my father went back to school and got a second degree in engineering. He became a civil engineer. He literally was a builder of bridges. And that means that I am the daughter of a builder of bridges. A bridge spans, it links, it unites two disconnected spaces. And that is what I seek to do in his honor. Now, my mission has been to use the power of language and narrative to change how people see the world and how we see one another. And as I said, the warmth of the suns took me 15 years. It took so long that by the time I finished it, uh, I remember excitedly telling some friends, I said, you know, I finally finished the book. And they said, what book? <laughs> People have often asked me, how did I keep going for 15 years? How do you do any one thing for that long? When I'm talking to uh, you know, young people who may be in middle school, literally it's longer than they had been alive, so how do you do that? And so one of the things I would say, first of all, on a practical level, once you're in year 11 or 12, what are you gonna do? I mean, you, if, you, if you stop then, then you've just lost 11 years of your life. You have nothing to show for it. And then you have no choice but to go forward, and that's what I ended up doing. But the other thing to learn or to might be relevant in understanding the work that I do is that it's called narrative nonfiction. It's a particular kind of nonfiction that requires all of the research that might go into any work of nonfiction, a tremendous amount of research. And then you convert that research into a narrative that's driven by character, driven by protagonists that one hopes you would have a chance to feel and see and experience what they've experienced. It's almost as if it's the closest that you'll ever come to being another person. And so that meant that I spent a lot of time with real people who shared with me their stories, their dreams, their hopes, their fears, their triumphs and their, their tragedies, even things that they had not told their own children. And so I made a promise to them that I would complete the mission and that was one of the reasons that kept me going as well. One of the people that I uh, spoke to had the chance, the honor of knowing in the process of working on this book, uh, The Warmth of the Suns, was a man named George Starling who said to me at one point, he said, if you don't finish this book soon, I'm going to be proofreading from heaven. <laughs> he was nudging me. Um, he was right. He did not live to see the completion of the book, but I do know that he's looked down upon all of this, and I think he's been very pleased and proud. I must say a little bit about what that book was about. It was about the Great Migration, which, which was the mass movement of six million black Southerners from all points in the South, including Texas, out to all of the rest of the country, not because they wished to leave, not because they wished to leave the only place that they'd known and the people that they loved, but that they felt Felt that they had no other option in order to be who and what they actually were inside. This great migration was the only time in American history that American citizens had to act like immigrants and flee the land of their birth just to be recognized as the citizens that they had always been. So this was not actually a move, it was kind of a defection, a seeking of political asylum within one's own country, tearfully so. And so what they were doing is that they were defecting a world that was so arcane that it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. You could go to jail if you were caught playing checkers with a person of a different race. This world, which I call a caste system of Jim Crow, was so arcane that, that in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually a black Bible and an, a separate, altogether separate white Bible, a black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. The very word of God was segregated in the Jim Crow South. This shows how extreme and how far people were willing to go to maintain the system that had propelled so many people to feel that they had no other option but to leave. Once they got out, they ended up being able to go to places that were not welcoming, 
because the people, the North wanted the labor but did not want the people, and how exactly do you do that? That's a whole other story. But what it ultimately did is it allowed them, despite the many restrictions and challenges and the hostility that they met in the places that they fled, it allowed them to be who they otherwise could not have been and they wished to have been in their own home. And that was people like Toni Morrison, Ralph Ellison, John Coltrane, the entire lineup of Motown, we might not know any of their names had there not been a great migration because many of these people were products of the great migration. Some of them might not even have existed had there not been a great migration because like me, their parents might not have met. So this most recent book, Cast, grew out of that and it was a book that I did not wish to write but I felt compelled to write in the era in which we find ourselves in. And one of the metaphors that I want to share with you from that book that has gone over so well and that people so can identify with is the recognition that our country has faced, has faced so many challenges throughout the centuries. But the idea of it is that this, our country is like an old house. And when you own an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a rain. But choose not to look, however, at your own peril. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester and will be there waiting for you until you discover what it is that's going on in that old house. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction, and therefore we might as well know that which is going on inside of our country. I view myself as kind of like the building inspector of this old house we call America. Now, uh, one of the things to remember, remember from that is that not one of us was alive at the time that the house was built. None of us alive are responsible for all of the many, many challenges that our country might have inherited, but we are the current occupants of this old house, and therefore any further deterioration is in fact on our hands. I believe in the potential of every single one of us to make this a fairer world for every single one of us by harnessing the power that we each individually hold in the individual spheres of influence that we may have. That each of us can be like the flap of the butterfly wings that, that creates a hurricane on the other side of the ocean. I'm inspired by the quiet power and the bravery of my ancestors and the ancestors of virtually everyone, many, many people, millions of people in this country who had to have done what the people in the Great Migration did, crossing the Atlantic Ocean, crossing the Pacific Ocean, crossing the Rio Grande to get to this country and hope that life might be better, whether they came from Ireland or Poland or Scotland or China or, or Louisiana, wherever they came from. And I'm inspired by the moment of de departure that had to have occurred in all of the families, whether people stayed in the South or whether they left. And that was the moment where uh, a young person has to make a difficult decision to leave all that they've known, whether they're crossing the Atlantic from, uh, from Ireland or Scotland or whether they're crossing the Pacific Ocean from, uh, from, from Asia, wherever it may be. And there is a young person who's standing at a dock about to board a ship uh, that's going to cross the Atlantic, cross an ocean. Or there is a young person who is uh, uh, loading up a truck that's going to cross the Rio Grande. Or there is a young person who is on a train, a, a train a station about to board a train that's going to carry them across rivers and, and mountains to get to what they hope will be freedom in the north. And there with them are the people who raised them, their mother, their father, their aunt, their uncle, their grandparents, whoever it might have been. And those older people are the people who decided to stay the people, which is the majority of people in any migration, they were not going to be able to make the crossing with them. That meant that as those young people looked in the eyes of those who had raised them, they might never see them again alive again. Think about the fact that there was no Skype, no Zoom, no FaceTime, no telephone, no, uh, long, no cell phones, not even reliable long distance telephone service. This was going to be the last time that for many of the people who were part of the Great Migration and part of the migrations that led to the creation of this country, that this would be the last time they would ever see their loved one alive. And that the next time they might hear of that loved one, or the last time that that person who, had, who was watching that, that young person leave, that that would be the, the last time that they would see, the, see them alive, see them in the face, and that the next time that they might hear anything about the people who had raised them might be a telegram saying that your father has passed away or that your mother is very, very ill and you must return home quickly if you were to see her alive again. 
This is the nature of the sacrifice that was made by so many people to create this country. And I want to close with the words of Richard Wright, who was one of the novelists and uh, one of the writers, one of the authors that we honor whenever we speak of literacy, whose name we might not have known as well because he was part of the Great Migration, having left Mississippi for Chicago uh, at the age of 19. And he wrote these words as a whisper, as a prayer about what is possible what is possible from an individual perspective of what can happen in a society when an individual makes a decision? And he said, uh, as a whisper to all of us about faith, he said, I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps, just perhaps, to bloom. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you for this honor. Thank you. Now, please welcome the mother of our only granddaughter, Addie, the very talented Sarah Beth Bush. Good evening. It is an honor to introduce you to one of the most celebrated authors of our time, a seven-time number one New York Times best-selling author. Nelson DeMille has mastered the art of action, adventure, and suspense. He has written 23 novels, 16 of which have made it to the New York Times bestseller list. While the tone of Nelson's writing varies from novel to novel, one consistent tool is his liberal use of sarcasm and dry humor. His most recent book, The Maze, is the eighth in a series featuring NYPD homicide detective John Corey, who readers first meet in Plum Island. His book, The Generalist's Daughter, was made into a major motion picture, and two more of his books, Word of Honor and May Day, have been adapted to television. Nelson is a former U.S. Army lieutenant and a decorated Vietnam veteran. He graduated from Hofstra University, holds three honorary doctorates, and is a former of president of Mystery Writers of America. It is no surprise that Nelson continues to be one of the most respected and beloved writers of the thriller genre. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm Texas welcome, Nelson DeMille. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. There's a, uh, a countdown clock here, you don't know that, but it's... We, we all got eight minutes. Elizabeth is a tough act to follow, but I'll try. Um, first of all, good, good to be back in Houston. I come here for just about every book on the, on the, um, the fabled or the, uh, what would you call the book tour? Authors have different, uh, different attitudes toward the book tour. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. But I say that Houston is always one of the better cities uh, it's a book city, and I always enjoy being here. <laughs> so I was here in October to promote The Maze, and uh, I think the sales went down after I left, but uh, <laughs> and happy to be back uh, today. So I've been talking to people during the day about, well, one of the quite, most, most frequently asked questions is, well, what's your next book? And uh, also, how is it to collaborate? Uh, most novelists don't collaborate. Some nonfiction um, writers collaborate because a lot of uh, research goes into a book. Uh, fiction uh, is supposed to be you know, creative and uh, you're not supposed to collaborate. I collaborated once on a book called May Day. Uh, that was a CBS TV movie. The book did very well. The collaboration was with a friend of mine, Tom Block, childhood friend. We knew, we knew each other since we were four years old. And he was a U.S. air pilot, and May Day, as you might imagine, was about, you know, it was an airline disaster novel. And at this point, uh, this was back in 1979, 1980, we known each other all our lives. And um, by the time we finished the book, we weren't speaking to each other. <laughs> and uh, seriously. And that lasted for about two years. And then we kind of buried the hatchet. So about... 
seven years ago, uh, I was negotiating with a publisher for a th typical three book deal. And they, they came to me and they said, we would like you to do three co-authored novels. And I said, like collaboration, which is, I, I, I have a sign on my desk that says collaborators will be shot, you know? And I said, no, I don't think so. But they, uh, they named the number and the number looked good. So I said, well, let's think about it, you know? So, uh, I, so I had three solo books in this contract and three co-authored books. And uh, we did a little contest. We, a um, uh, few agents knew writers who were looking for, you know, good writers who were looking for uh, something to do. And we did a kind of a blind contest. We, we all wrote one chapter, the same chapter, basically, that we, excuse me, that we described. So it was blind. We didn't know who they were. And uh, one guy won. You know, we, uh, I picked this guy. We could call him Mike because I fired him later. So I'll give you his last name. But it was the, 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 the kind of disaster that I knew it was going to be. Um, and he wasn't a bad writer. It's just that we, you know, we were not on the same page, uh, literally and figuratively. So I said to my agents, I, just, I don't want to do this. And I said, no, but this is like, you remember that number that they gave you? you gotta, I said, I really don't care. But, so when I am sitting, uh, this is about four years ago, I'm sitting by myself having a, an adult beverage in my Lazy Boy recliner. And I'm thinking about, I don't know what I was thinking about, but my son Alex's name popped into my mind. Why? Because he's a screenwriter and he was kind of like between screenplays. And I said, my God, I think I might have found my co-author. But I wasn't sure Alex had ever read any of my novels, so I'm not sure that he really wanted to be a co-author. Uh, he's he'd done about 14, 15 screenplays and one of his uh, movies actually was uh, my number one at Comic-Con about five years ago. Uh, so I gave him a call, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I said, would you like to be a co-author with me on, my, you know, on three novels? And he said, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, not, not in this lifetime. But then I, um, I named the number, and, uh, <laughs> and he said, well, let's talk, you know. Because he came, in, he came into it with a lot of trepidation, and so did I, uh, knowing what happened with like a childhood friend that you know kind of ruined the relationship. And but Alex was a screenwriter; he knew how to do screenplays. He knew you know Act One, Act Two, Act Three, the arc of the story, and all that. And his dialogue was certainly good. Um, but this was not the kind of thing he would you know he normally did. Uh, he was you know he was. But I'm thinking you know this kid's got to pay me the Yale tuition back. Four years at Yale and. And, and three years at UCLA with a graduate degree in film writing, uh, screenplays. So um, I sat down with them and I said, this is the way it's done. Read my books. I know you've probably never read them before, but try to read my books. And um, he kind of got into it. And it was kind of an interesting experience in that he, uh, he was learning from me, obviously, but I was learning something from him. I was learning a little bit more brevity. Some of my books tend to go on a little bit longer. Um, I was learning some younger speech patterns that I was not picking up on at my, in my mid-70s. But obviously he, uh, being you know, 40 years old, uh, had, a different, had different speech, different words, different phrases, and just different, um, different world views. But you know, could we blend this together? That was, that was the, uh, the, uh, the real challenge. His mother, my, my former wife, who I get along with very well, called me a few times and she said, you know, you're, you're, you're being too hard on him. I said, you've said that since he was like three months old. You know, I was like, hey, leave it alone. We're, we're, doing, we're doing well together. And finally we came out with um, a book called um, The Deserter, which was my first, looking at my time, my, <laughs> our first co-author book, my first since 1980 with uh, May Day. Uh, so the, the deserter was based loosely on the Bo Bergdahl uh, desertion. You might remember seven or eight, nine years ago, Bo Bergdahl uh, left, he deserted from his unit in Afghanistan, and he was captured by the Taliban and that type of, so we decided to novelize that. And it was an interesting, you know, um, experience. He knew nothing about the army. I knew, you know, enough about the army, but he uh, brought into it the, um, the those characters who were of that age that, that that thought you know kind of more like he did than than, than thought like uh, I did, 
So it was successful, so we decided to do a second one. Um, and this one is called Bloodlines. Uh, which is another question everybody's asking, what's your next novel? My next novel is this co-authored book with Alex uh, called Bloodlines. It will be out October 10th. Um, you can go on Amazon now and look at it. Um, you can actually pre-order it if you like. Uh, <laughs> but no, no, uh, no, no, no reason to do that right now. Uh, but it is finished. It's actually sitting uh, on my desk right now. I need to get back and look at it one more time. I get the galley proofs next week. I read them. Then I give them to him and he reads them. And uh, we'll probably both be uh, back here in Houston right after October 10th. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Good. I'll get this way. Uh, we'll skip the intro. <laughs> uh, I'm Julian. I'm married to Ashley Bush. Um, and for our next author, uh, our next author is no stranger to the stage. With more than 20 years as a stand-up comedian and writer, Tom Papa is one of the top comedic voices in the country, finding success in film, TV, radio, and podcasts, as well as on the live stage. He is a frequent panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and a host of a daily serious XM show, What a Joke, with Tom and Papa and Fortune, and host of a hit podcast, Come to Papa. Papa has also recorded five stand-up specials currently streaming, including You're Doing Great and What a Day. Papa has written three books, Your Dad Stole My Rake, You're Doing Great and Other Reasons to Stay Alive, and We're All in This Together, set for release this June. He is currently touring across the United States, so we are particularly delighted he has joined us here tonight. When not on tour and making people laugh, Papa lives in Los Angeles and bakes bread with his wife, daughters, cat, and somewhat loyal dog. Please give a warm Houston welcome to Tom Papa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very nice intro to a guy that got no intro at all. I don't know what you did in this family, but it's not good. <laughs> so nice to be here. I was here only about uh, six or eight months ago in this building, performing at the other theater over there, which has uh, slightly fewer people. And um, it was beautiful, and it was nice to be here. And uh, that performing, doing stand-up for an hour and a half, is uh, not as intimidating as this. This is scary. And uh, I feel a little like I don't belong. These are amazing Pulitzer Prize winning legendary authors. Uh, and I write weird jokes. <laughs> I feel like one of the characters that Tess was talking about earlier. I felt like when everyone else was giving their speeches, I kind of stroked out and died. <laughs> and then I came to during that intro, and here I am. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, thank you for the set. This is uh, uh, amazing. I feel like I'm in Disney at one of those animatronic things. <laughs> well, you should read. <laughs> that is my new book, and uh, that, is, uh, that is what I've been feeling lately. Uh, I travel all around this country. I tour nonstop, and I do feel that we are much more united uh, than the cable news allows us to feel. And I feel that there are beautiful people out there that we can learn from. Um, people that are around us right now and people that came before us. And uh, look, it's nice to think that we're all unique. And it's nice to think that we're special little snowflakes like we were taught. But you're pretty much the same as everybody else. You're exactly the same as everybody else. Just take one walk down uh, an aisle at CVS and you'll re realize uh, you're not the first person to be a human being. There have been people trying to cure bunions and get rid of disgusting rashes and stop being a little gassy way before you. So keep your eyes open and just realize we're all the same. 
And all those people that are, you think are you're different from, you're, you're not. You can learn from all of these people. You can learn from the people from the past. You can learn from people uh, right around you, you know? We, you're fat. You're fat. You're fat. I know you feel fat. So do I. This is why we don't dress up like this at home. This hurts. There's a lot of cinching going on. As soon as this is over, the first thing you do when you get home, clothes off. We're all fat. You're either really fat, kind of fat, or trying not to be fat. Either way, fat's coming. And that's all right. That's okay. We're all the same. You're fat. Big deal. So don't tell me what you're quitting. Don't tell me what you're quitting. I don't care what thing, new idea that you think you came up with. Oh, I'm quitting gluten. I'm quitting sugar. I don't care. You're my friend. You looked awful yesterday. You're going to look a little worse tomorrow. Why are we talking about this? Let's get some ice cream and enjoy the day. You're doing great. I have friends in my life that don't eat bread anymore. They don't eat bread. They don't eat bread. Why are you even here? No toast with your coffee in the morning? Kill yourself. Make some room for people who know how to live. So you don't have the body of an Olympic athlete. Well, guess what? You're not an Olympic athlete. You're done from sales. You've got a fat ass. You wear khakis. You hike them up when you walk. You're not the first one to feel this way. You're not the first one. You know, I know there's pressure. You see people on social media, and they're always yelling at you to be better, that you're not good enough. You're good enough. You're doing it. Well, I don't know how any of you are living, but you're alive. You're alive. You're still going. So you're doing something right. I know you're probably not on some special program or anything. It's probably just momentum. But you're still here, so good, good for you. You're doing great. Look, when I see people on social media and they've got abs, there's always some guy with no shirt on yelling at you to be more. Stop being so lazy. You should look like me. You want these abs? No, I don't. I'm not impressed by that. Are you impressed by that? I see people with abs, I don't think, oh, that guy's fun. I think, well, what, what, what kind of lonely existence is this guy living? He's, he's definitely alone. He's alone. You can't do that many crunches and have people around. He's alone in a one-bedroom apartment with a pull-up bar, drinking protein shakes, and crapping like a goat. It's not impressive. You're impressive. You. You're impressive. You think abs can get a whole family ready for breakfast in the morning? You think abs can do that? Get a whole family of needy people fed, dogs, kids? All, God forbid they all eat the same thing. They won't do that. Everyone has to eat the different... You think abs can handle that kind of pressure? Get everybody out the door and then, and then drop them all off at school? Run a family? Abs can't do that. You do that. Sit, uh, you pick them up at the end of the day, sit in a dentist's office and wait for your kid to come out and you sit in that little chair reading a bad magazine waiting for a $5,000 bill because the little bastard didn't brush his teeth. And you knew he wasn't brushing his teeth, you knew it. You knew it, but you didn't want to be a pain in the ass and yell at him every night. So you let him go, you let him go. And he lied to you. He lied to you. You even feel his bristles, and they were wet. But that's as far as he went. That was a con job. He was pretending to brush his teeth, and now you got a $5,000 bill. You think abs can do that? No. No. So block those people that tell you you're not good enough. Block those people that tell you that you're separate from your neighbors. You're not. You know who I follow now on Instagram? I follow French bakers. Little Baker, my one favorite one, he's about two feet tall, he's five feet wide, he's just one ab, he's one giant ab. 
and he bakes croissants. That's all he does. He bakes croissants, makes them, and then bakes them, and then takes them out and peels them apart, and the steam comes out, and he eats them on camera, and I get aroused. <laughs> the little things. The little things. That's what you have to pay attention to. Don't pay attention to the noise. Pay attention to each other. Pay attention to your family. Pay attention to your neighbors. And uh, this is wonderful. I can't believe you uh, brought me here. Uh, it's really, truly an honor. I just started this writing journey. Uh, I was really proud that I had three books until today. <laughs> I have so much more work to do. And you put me up in a nice hotel, and that's the greatest gift you can give me. I have a bed alone tonight. I get to sleep by myself. And look, I hope you all can uh, have a wonderful lives, and I hope you find love. It's the most important thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean if you do fall in love, you have to live with the same person. And uh, it, it doesn't mean you have to sleep with the same person to the end of your days. Uh, you shouldn't. You should sleep separately. That's a punishment, especially over 40. Over 40, you should sleep in the other room. If you're over 40, you have a 50% chance of getting a good night's sleep tonight. Tonight, 50% chance. And not because you did something crazy, not because you went on a cocaine bender. No, someone had a cookie after six. <laughs> Donna had cheese at the party. Oh no, she's not gonna breathe right for a week. My wife has a lot going on. You, you deal with this too, I'm sure. She, she grinds her teeth in her sleep. She's so nervous, she grinds her own teeth in her sleep. And rather than find out the cause of that, they don't do that. Instead, they give her an NFL-issued mouthpiece and just shove that in her mouth like a chew toy from Petco. And she gnaws on it, like an angry beaver. She goes through three or four a month. I wake up with bits of plastic all over my face. And it's blue, and it glows in the dark. Yeah. That's how I know if we're fooling around at night. If I see a blue floaty thing coming across the room. Not tonight. No, she just put on her equipment. Put on her headgear and her mouthpiece and her eucalyptus ointments. Climbs into bed with her unshaved legs like a koala bear. Like an angry koala bear trying out for the Packers. And she gets up to pee like six, seven times a night. I didn't know a woman could have a swollen prostate, but she does. And when she walks, her ankle pops. It pops. Pop, 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 pop. You don't hear it during the day, but at three o'clock in the morning, loudest sound you'll ever hear. Pop, 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 trying to breathe through her mouthpiece. Ooh. Ooh. Pop, pop, pop. It's like Darth Vader's trapped in bubble wrap in my bedroom. So thank you for the room. Thank you for inviting me. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. I'm Chao Hua, a 46-year-old Chinese Vietnamese immigrant. I'm the owner, operator of Chao Salon. I've been a hairdresser for 27 years. I picked this profession because of my conflicts in school and home. I dropped out of high school my junior year. My interest was in fashion and I knew I could make a good living taking care of myself as a hairdresser. In my mid-twenties, I attempted to go to college. Knowing my struggles in school, I enrolled in the ESL class. I was bright enough to pass the course, but I didn't have the correct tools and foundation to stay in college. In my thirties, I had a wonderful client a psychologist who suggested I take a cognitive assessment. After the assessment, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and was recommended to attend Nye House Education Center. Nye House is the only adult literacy program in Houston where classes are taught by certified academic language therapists to help students reach their reading goals. Thanks to Nye House Education, I have conquered difficulties in reading and writing which I thought would not be possible. Thank you, Nye House. Our life-changing work is made possible through the generosity of donors such as the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. 
My mom believed every adult deserves a second chance in life by learning how to read. And she spent much of her life promoting adult and family literacy programs. We are proud to partner with the Mayor's Office for Adult Literacy and community-based adult literacy providers across our city like Nye House Education Center to elevate adult and family literacy as priorities and to assure more people like Chow have access to the programs and resources they need to fully participate in society, engage in our workforce, and be their child's first and most important teacher. I invite you to learn more about Houston's Adult Literacy Blueprint and the incredible work of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. Together, we can break the intergenerational cycle of low literacy in our city. To introduce our closing author, please welcome the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star, our son, Pierce Bush. The Reverend Dr. Russell J. Levinson, Jr. has been an ordained Episcopal minister for over 30 years. For 15 of those years, he has served as rector of Houston's own St. Martin's Episcopal Church, the largest Episcopal Church in North America, and the church that my Ganny and Gampy faithfully attended for more than five decades. Reverend Levinson's book, Witness to Dignity, The Life and faith of George H.W. and Barbara Bush offers unique insight into my grandparents' wit and wisdom, their commitment to faith, family, and friends, and their tireless desire to serve and better the lives of their neighbors and of many people across our country. Dr. Levinson played a special role in my grandparents' lives. He joined our family at Ganey and Gampy's bedside during their final moments of life and officiated and preached at their memorial services here and in Washington, D.C. He holds a very special place in our hearts, in the hearts of our entire family, Russ. Without further ado, please welcome an incredible human being and a man of faith, Reverend Dr. Russell J. Levinson, Jr. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me follow Tom. <clears throat> I mean, this was going to be moving and touching, and now, and I'll talk, where are you, Tom? You haven't left it. I was really thinking about having you preach until we got to the ass and the fart jokes, and then I decided, <laughs> eh, I'm going to have to back off on that. So, I do feel like we're kind of in the seventh inning stretch. I feel like y'all need to get up and move around, but we're, we're not going to do that. I do want to tell you, I'm, I'm, I, um, I'm watching. I want to unplug this. Can I unplug the timer? No. Um, but I'm very cognizant of my time, and um, one of the things I, I'm, I'm going to do is read to you from the book a little bit. But as I opened it up, I carry this around. This is a bumper sticker that many of us who worked around the bushes the last few years used to keep. What would Barbara do? <laughs> if you want this one, it's for, up for auction tonight. So I do feel like we are in the living room, which you did a great job. Uh, I spent a lot of time... Uh, particularly in the last few years with the President Barr in uh, the living room there. And um, you need to know, many of you know this if you knew the President Barbara, uh, if you ever called Barbara Mrs. Bush, she would say, no, 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 call you. Mrs. Bush was my, was my mother-in-law. You can call me Barr, call me Barbara, but don't call me Mrs. Bush. So I never did that again. The President never said, do not call me Mr. President. So I always called him, <laughs> except when we prayed. And I uh, but uh, the funny thing about looking at this is many of you probably visited the house. One of the things I love to say to people in Houston is if you knew the, the how many of you met the Bushes? Raise your hand if you can see. Look, half the room. And how many of you, I would say, how many of you, I only do this in Houston, but how many of you have a story about the Bushes? Everybody raises their hand because you didn't just meet them. You got to encounter with them. And, and one of the things that I began to, I didn't start thinking about writing the book until a few years ago. I have written other books, by the way and um, nobody knows about those. They're also on Amazon, sir. And, um, and by the way, Tess, where's Tess? Where's Tess? Tess, you know what? I, I actually worked for a guy. They thought he was dead, and he got up three days later. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great, it's a great story. It's 
really, it's 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 a bestseller actually. Uh, still making two thousand years old. It's a story they're still telling. So, um, but I, uh, if you went to the Bushes' house for many years, uh, Barr and and the president had two obnoxious dogs named BB and Minnie. And everybody got bit by BB and Minnie. And so what's missing from here is a little pillow with BB or Minnie growling at you. <clears throat> and so one of the stories I tell in the book is that uh, I, I, what I wanted to do was reveal um, what I got to know in the last 11 and a half years of their lives, which was their humor, their humility, uh, their character, integrity, and dignity, which we saw in the public realm, but which my wife, Laura, and I, and my children got to see in the private realm. But a big part of that was humor. And, you know, humor is connected to the word humility in many ways. So they were self-effacing in lots of ways. So we were at the house one day, and as we were leaving, uh, my wife bent over, and this is in the book, my wife bent over to give the president a little kiss. We had had some prayer time and some visiting. And, and as she did, um, BB bit my wife on the leg. And Barr was so, she was, oh, I can't, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe it. I've got to see the wound. And my wife said, oh, no, no, I'm fine. And this went on, and we walked all the way to the door, and Barbara said, I can't let you leave this house until I see your your leg. I need to, and my wife pulled up, was it a pantsuit or a, and, and she, and it's bleeding and there's a wound and Barbara goes, oh, I'm sorry. And, um, <clears throat> that's what she does. And, um, we left and the next day, uh, my wife who works at Memorial Park here, one of the greatest places in Houston, I think she was a volunteer there. She was coming back from her volunteer work there and she saw someone pulling away from the house. It was a car and, uh, and she got, the car pulled away. My wife got in the house. Laura got in the house, opened the door. There was a beautiful orchid there. And uh, it said, Dear Laura, I'm so sorry about the bite. You look just good enough to eat. Sorry. <laughs> Love, BB. Uh, um, I will tell you, uh, and Tom, you can, where, where's Tom? Oh, you're asleep again. Um, no. You can add this one to your lineup if it works. But uh, I, um, I gave this to somebody to read beforehand, and, um, and, and they brought up the word saint. They said, you make them out to be saints. And I'm going to come back to that because it reminded me of one of my favorite stories I like to tell about saints, which was this fellow, we'll call him Jack, died. He was a horrible guy. Everybody in town knew it. He caroused. He was cheated on his friends. He cheated on his wife. He drank too much. He was a horrible guy. And when he died, his brother came in to... Uh, plan the funeral with the pastor. And he says, Pastor, I want you to do my brother's funeral. And, and as you do Jack's funeral, I, I need you to at some point say he's a saint. And the pastor goes, well, I can't do that. Everybody knew your brother. Horrible guy. Drank too much. Cheated. Nobody liked Jack. He says, but please, he says, really, if you could work it in, just to somehow say he was a saint. And the pastor goes, get out of office. So he thinks about it. He, he kind of warms to the idea, gets up for the homily, starts to talk about him. And he says, you know, uh, we all knew Jack. He's a horrible guy. Everybody hated him, drank too much, slept around. You know, it's just, he's a horrible guy. But, you know, compared to his brother, <clears throat> that's pretty good. So... Um, I say that to say the president and bar were not saints, but I've worked with a lot of people in 30 years of ordained ministry, and they were about as close as you could get. And the thing that we got to observe was um, two people in those last years of their lives um, show us and remind us what Barbara often talked about, that when all the crowds are gone and the dust is settled, the only thing that remains, friends, family, and faith. And we got to see that. We got to see that incarnate in a way in which it reminded us how important it was and how important those things were to them. And so as anyone would want to do is to stand back. And, and so that's where the title comes from. I, I really wanted to kind of be a, a mirror, if I could, that spoke of this life that I was able to observe. And what I witnessed was two incredible people who lived with dignity, served with dignity, aged with dignity, loved with dignity, and finally in the end died with dignity. And as we all watched those services that were an honor for me to plan with them, we were reminded of how precious what they gave to this city, this state, this nation, and this world, what both of them gave, for which we need to be eternally grateful. And I wanted to do what I could to encapsulate that through several stories. And so I hope 
those of you who read the book will find that to be true, and I hope you'll be reminded of what real, true dignity, character, and integrity are, particularly in the time in which we live. A lot of us uh, have nostalgic feelings about times when it seemed like our nation was more united and uh, people worked together for a greater good. I think there's a lot of that going on. Uh, but nostalgia is not just about thinking about the good old days. It can invite us to wish for better days. And so I hope that as you read this book, as you remember while we're here tonight, as we honor this incredible work that they've done in our midst, that you are reminded of what we can be and we should be. And in many places we are, but we've got ways to go. Before I read this little last passage to you, I would like to um, say that I think we all are grateful uh, to Julie Baker Fink, to the foundation, to the whole Bush family, and I would say particularly to Neil and Maria for all that they do for so many people in this city, in this state, in this nation. Just thank you so much for what you do. One of, I loved being with both of them, and it was an honor to be with both of them at the time of their death. And, and even in the end, you all, there was some moments of, of humor, if you can. It, 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 there was a mom, there were moments where they were able to do that. Um, and Barbara could do this in such a wonderful way, those of you who knew and loved her. Uh, one time we were invited to Kenny Bunkport, and, and she invited us to bring our whole family, which included our kids, which included two teenage boys, which are, what? Uh, do you bring, you know, what teenage boys do at the dinner table? And so, but, and she said, and tell the kids to bring friends. And we were like, oh, ooh, okay. So uh, the kids brought friends, including my son, who at the time was dating somebody that was not our favorite. And, uh, and that became very obvious because we used to land in Boston, drive to Kenny Bunkport, and we would have a lecture with our kids about what to do when you get to the Walker's Point. You Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, you listen more than all the things that kids are, don't do, but they're supposed to do. And so, but this guest came, the son's girlfriend, and, uh, and this lecture was lost on her. And we um, get to Walker's Point, and we go to the main house, and we're sitting there, and within a few minutes, this young lady is having a disagreement with Barbara Bush. <clears throat> Over, do you, have you heard this story? Over how to pronounce Ralph Lauren. And I wanted to, and your mother kindly said, uh, you know, we just married into that family. Um, and I wanted to jump across and tackle her to the floor. And we thought we were going to be kicked off the, out of the family for good. This went on for a little while. Later, and this is in the book, later we kind of break up and go off to the various places we're sleeping. And Barbara goes, why don't you and Laura stay here? I want you to look at this book here. And, and we're kind of, that's unusual. And so we're looking at this book and the president goes off to bed. Barbara goes off to bed. We're, I'm kind of, and Barbara comes back over. She's in her slippers, her nightgown, her robe. And she leans in and she goes, so what are we going to do about the girl? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, yeah, what are we going to do about the girl? Uh, that's in the book, but you got to read the book to get the rest of the story. The last day of, of um, the president's life and Barbara's life and being in those moments were probably some of the most powerful in all of my ministry, in large part because we had spent so much time with the whole family. And so what I want to read to you now as I close uh, is um, a little bit about what happened that, that very last day. Um, several of us and many of the, the people who are gathered here, and you'll hear these names here, were gathered um, with Bar for the last few days in and out. And there was a day in which we thought she was leaving us, and um, I think Neil called and asked me to come over and pray. And, and we were gathered, and we actually thought she was on her way to our Lord's heaven. And um, we were gathered, and I came in, and the president was there, and I said, I hear your, I hear your girlfriend's sick. And he said, yeah, she is. And he kind of teared up. And, um, uh, and I said, do you want me to go up? And she was upstairs. Do you want to go up and be with her? And Dora went up, and the daughter, and came back down and said, no, Mom, Mom wants you to stay with Dad. And he looked at me and said, I want you to go pray with her. Said, You're the president. So I, I went up, and I knocked on the door. And, uh, and honestly, the door was cracked, and Barr goes, I'm not checking out yet. <laughs> and I said, Barr, can I come in for a minute? Your husband wants me to pray with you and visit. So we did, and we talked and prayed. 
And I'm leaving, and I'm pulling the door closed to go back downstairs, and she goes, uh, Russ. And she called me back in the room, and I came back in, and she said, uh, I said, Bar, are you okay? She said, yep. Just tell him I adore him. So I go back downstairs, and I sit with the president of the family, and I said, uh, he said, what'd she say? And I said, well, first of all, she said she's not checking out yet. And secondly, she wants you to know she adores you. Um, she stayed with us another day and a half or so, and then oddly enough, five years ago this last Monday, um, we gathered again at the house. And um, strangely, that day, uh, we, we lived not too far from where the president lived. Uh, the power didn't go out uh, very often in that area. I think I know why, but it didn't go out very often. But strangely, and this is part of the story, strangely, that day it did for several hours. And the president was with Bar all day, as were the children and Neil and many of the children were so great about coming in to read to her. And, um, and um, so this was kind of going on and we were getting, we knew we were getting toward the end and um, the president was brought, he, he only left for a short time uh, and then came back and, and I think I'm just going to read and close out that way if I could. Keep this in mind, Barbara's last word, her last word was home. Um, we knew it was close but did not know when it would be. Jean Becker, who is the president's chief of staff, called and said she had been talking with 43 and felt like we all needed to pray that if this was Barr's time, now was the time to pray even more for a peaceful and timely death, not one that lingered for days. So I went downstairs and went to the side garden of the house and prayed. I gave thanks for Barr's life and prayed that if this was the time, then let it be the time, a peaceful and a painless death. Neil came out and joined me. He had been such a constant presence in Barbara's life, especially in these last years, and I can only imagine what he was feeling. I told him I was praying for our Lord to gently receive his mom. Neil did not want to see her leave, but he agreed that pr this prayer was needed at this time, and we talked for a bit, and then I went back inside. Given her steady decline, and not wanting on the local power company to set things right, and I'll kind of jump ahead just a little bit because I'm watching my time clock. If I heard it once, I heard it two dozen times. As the president sat there holding her hand throughout the day, he said, Bar, I love you. I love you, Bar, with such brazen passion and tenderness that it was palpable. At one point when she and he and I were together alone, he looked at me and gently smiled and pointed at her and then pointed toward heaven. Yes, sir, I said, that's where she'll be. At 5.30, the power was still out. By then, Bar's physician had arrived and both he and Evan told everyone, we are there. If there's anything you want to say, now's the time to say it. Neil asked me to pray again, and I anointed her head with a cross of oil. The president was holding her hand, as he had been all day. Everyone in the room, everyone in the room, all of us, then knelt by her bed. Neil and Maria, Pierce and Sarah Beth, Evan, who was his um, medical aide, Neely, who was Barbara's aide, uh, Marshall, uh, the, uh, their grandchild, and I, we all put our hands on her, and again we prayed the prayers that we had prayed only a few nights before. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Barbara. As we prayed, we wept and held on to one another and held Barbara. In my entire life, this was one of the few moments where the demonstrable presence of God was as real to me as the pages of the book you're holding now. When I finished with Amen, everyone was weeping and telling Bar, I love you. And the doctor was near, and Bar took her final breath. She's gone, he whispered. And the president asked him to repeat it. She's gone to heaven, Mr. President. The Celtic Christians teach about something they call thin places. Thin places are those times and moments, people and experiences that you have or encounter, and for whatever reason at that juncture, at that meeting point, the line between heaven and earth is so thin it is hardly detectable, if detectable at all. I will share a few of those thin places with you in this book, and here is one. At the moment the bar's physician said the second time, she's gone to heaven, Mr. President. At that very moment, the lights, the power, came back on. In that instant, we were all still kneeling, still all weeping. Maria lifted her head and looked at me and whispered, what does that mean? And I said, I don't know, but let's take it for what it's worth. Now is a time for family, not for those of us who are not. So Evan, Neely, the doctor, and I left, and the door closed. We were quietly standing in the hall outside the room. Pierce opened the door and said, Russ, he wants you to come in and pray again. Uh, 
So I came in and then knelt in front of the president and by Barr's body, and I placed their hands together, his on top of hers, and I put my hands around both of theirs. I gave thanks for her life. I prayed that God would welcome one of his own. I prayed that God would comfort the president and all Barr left behind. I thank God for the love and witness of these two and this wonderful family. When I finished, the president and I were both in tears, and, but while I was still on my knees, I took his face in my hands and I said, Mr. President, she is at peace now. She is in heaven. She is with her parents and your parents, and she's with your dear Robin, and you will see her again. And you, sir, will be okay. We will take care of you. We love you. I love you. I love you, he said. I kissed him on the cheek and stepped back out of the room. It was up to that point the most intense moment in my ordained ministry. God was present and real and there in that moment. And Barbara, Barbara was home. A few weeks after the funeral, um, the president's chief of staff, Jean Becker, who became a very close friend, uh, called me to her office and said, I have something I want to give you. And I said, um, okay, so I went over to the office and when I came in, uh, she said, I want to give you this. And it was the president in Barr's prayer book. And um, I said, well, somebody else should have this or a museum should have this. Or she said, no, they would want you to have this. So this holds a very special place in my heart and in my home. And um, so before we leave, I want to pray a prayer for all of us. Um, so can I invite you to stand? One of the president's favorite sayings was preach Christ at, preach Christ at all times, if necessary, use words. Uh, and it was attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Um, I will tell you this little thing about clergy. If we don't know who really said it, we usually say Francis of Assisi <laughs> or Augustine or Mother Teresa. And I will say, or Barbara Bush. Um, so, but this, this prayer is attributed to uh, St. Francis, and I think it honors these two incredible people. And um, I think it's a prayer perhaps we all need to take to heart. So let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Now please be seated. I have a really special treat for you. If you watch the memorial services, which both the president and Barr really did want to be celebratory, and they were, but particularly the two that were held at St. Martin's. You were fortunate to hear our choir, and so I leaned in on this wonderful choir of St. Martin's, and I asked whether or not they would come and sing for you tonight. So they're going to sing one piece that was sung at Barbara's service, one piece that was sung at the President's service. I think you're going to be really glad that they're here. And let me pause and say, if you don't have a church, uh, we're there on Sunday. <laughs> and this is the choir you get to hear. So under the directed of uh, our uh, wonderful staff, particularly Dr. David Henning, the director of our music program, meet the St. Martin's Choir, and I welcome them uh, to the stage.
amazing. My, my parents um, derived a lot of comfort and strength from Russ, you, and your clergy, and from this amazing choir. I'm sorry, I, I promise I'm not going to cry. Okay, I'm good. I'm back. I'm back. I'm good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> from this amazing choir. They, they, anyway, thank you very much. Let's give it up one more time for the St. Martin's Choir. Thank you very much. Um, I want to Pay a special thanks to the authors who have made a special effort to be with us today, flown from all over the place. 
um, from London through various cities and LA, uh, you know, Long Island, Maine, Camden, Maine. So thank you guys for coming. You've made this a very special evening. Please give it up to the amazing authors that attended tonight. Um, Maria and I and Julie are especially grateful for the, in, the incredible generosity of the sponsors that have, have reached deep into their pockets to help fund the great work being done at, at uh, Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. So thank you to the sponsors. I want to thank every, each and every one of you that has attended tonight. Your support means the world to us. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you for your support. This has been a great evening, the best ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh -huh.